Singing as I am with you, for I won't be with you long. Well, I'll show time for to be here a long time to be gone. A good Thursday morning to you, and welcome to Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson here with you, alongside our technical producer, Samuel G. Brooks. Good morning, everyone. You're wearing your... Can, can you take the Sam cam for a sec? Oh, no, but you adjusted. Oh. I was curious. I thought people might be might be interested okay. to see this if is, you're... This is the look that you're going what's for What's going here. on with the headphones what's today, going Sam? In? Oh, this is just a... Uh, this is a little studio trick, is if you need to hear somebody across the room, you just pop one ear off. Okay, you look That's like... Uh, you look like a big-time club DJ there. <laughs> I love it. How are you feeling this morning? I was going to fix the hair after you do that, though. I'm feeling good. I was, you know, I kind of told you when we came in here, I was a little, uh, I was a little, I think the best word is just kind of brain dead yesterday. I was, I was having a day like we were here for the show. We joked around. We had a really good time on the show. Great time. And, and you know, I, I just, I spent a lot of the day yesterday just kind of feeling tired and out of it. And I think it's really just COVID fatigue setting in. Anyway, I, uh, you know, I, um. I feel great this morning. How I feel is a little COVID, recharged. How is COVID fatigue manifesting itself with you? Because this is a this is a real thing. Yeah, you know, I think the way it manifests with me is it's just like I find I'm a super extroverted person, and right now my daily routine is I come here, I do the show, I go home. Maybe I get some groceries or like stop at a hardware store in between. That's basically all I do now. Yeah. And, you know, in absence of like an evening social life, I just get really, really tired. And so I think the fatigue is just, you know, lack of connection with people. Like I'm really grown wary on outdoor visits and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't dislike them, but I'm just, I'm sort of at the point where I'm just, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm feeling it really hit me lately, you know? I like that you're talking about it. I like that you're saying well, thank it. Thank you. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think more people need to say it. Yeah, I agree. It sucks. The yeah. pandemic sucks, and we're going to get through this. It sucks, and we're going to get through it, and uh, and we're going to get through it together, pal. Thank you. And uh, I'm grateful to have you here. We just got this email from Tanya. Tanya's pro she sent this email 40 minutes ago to talk at ryanjesperson.com, so she's probably not expecting to have it read. I want to read it right out of the gates because I love it. I'm going to read it before we even recognize our presenting sponsor. Ooh. And we probably have a guest right now hanging tight, ready to not, go out of Arkansas. Not quite yet, but he, uh, okay, yeah. He'll be checking in. We'll be we, checking in soon. We asked, keeping good, tabs. we asked Professor Jacob Held to join us for 940 Central Time, which would be 840 Mountain Time, 1040 Eastern Time. I don't mean to show off with my mastery of mathematics, everybody, but Professor Held is going to join us to talk about Dr. Seuss, and I'm very much looking forward to it. He's also working on an eighth edition to Philosophy of Sex, so maybe we can get into that too. But the publishers, the, 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 uh, the folks that own the rights to Dr. Seuss's work have said, as we told you in our news a few days ago, have said that there's six titles, 
that they're not going to publish anymore because they they contain either uh, uh, racist overtones or or probably overt racism in some cases. They say they're not going to publish them anymore. Like this one, if I ran the zoo, uh, like McElligot's pool, and uh, like and to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. Well, here's the thing: if you own books like this. You may or may not be aware that they're now selling for thousands of dollars in some cases. I mean, not all of them. It's it, it's like sports cards. If you have them in really great condition, if they're not creased and bent and colored on and ripped. In some cases, they're selling for thousands of dollars because they've now become collector's editions. So we're going to talk to Professor Held about this in just a second. He's essentially the definitive voice on Dr. Seuss uh, in North America. And I'm very excited that he's uh, agreed to join us. Plus, we're going to be talking about bias on university campuses. And boy, are a bunch of people afraid of this conversation today. It's unbelievable. I've got a bunch of of uh, of loud voices uh, really, really criticizing the fact that we're going to have uh, an important conversation today, friends. And I'll get into that in just a second. And maybe I'll throw a little punches because I'm feeling a little ornery this morning. Uh, and, uh, and and we'll see where that goes. You never know. This is going to be an edition of Real Talk where we're going to keep the real talk in real talk. So buckle up, everybody. Tanya says, good morning. The subject of her email, our warped perceptions limit our growth. She says, yesterday's show had me pause for a moment and likely not in a way, Ryan, that you intended. It happened seconds after you introduced Kelly Thompson. And I know exactly what Tanya's getting at here. The the minute that I read, Sam, the first sentence of Tanya's email, I knew what she was talking. I knew what she was going to get at. She says, seconds after you introduced Kelly Thompson, the CEO and chair of an investment company, Kelly appeared on camera and my brain said, that's a CEO? Aren't? Alberta CEOs, all old white guys in suits. And then I caught myself as the interview earlier in the week where you spoke with women entrepreneurs and venture capitalists. And, 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 and it also leapt into my mind. You can't be a CEO. You're a nurse. And then finally, says Tanya, and all of this is happening within seconds. She says, hooray for the human brain. I was reminded of that horrid UCP ad. <laughs> if you're joining us from outside Alberta. She's talking about Alberta's government, the United Conservatives, from a few months back where they waxed on about Alberta, trying to sell Alberta. And every image that the advertisement showed was of cowboys and trucks and oil fields and white guys. And there in the center of all that metacognition, there was a minor aha moment. See, it's only listeners and viewers of Real Talk that use words like metacognition. (laughs) <laughs> the people that don't know what that means are listening to the AM radio shows right now. <laughs> Tanya says, Alberta, we hold ourselves back by the way we continue to brand ourselves consciously or subconsciously. And if we see ourselves as a bunch of white male oil field workers in pickup trucks or white male CEOs in suits. And if that is the image we expect to see reflected back at us in the media or in our governments or in how others view us, we're shooting ourselves in the foot midsection and probably shooting ourselves in an arm or two as well. We are so much more than that. We have incredible intelligence, diversity, resilience, skill, and ingenuity to offer each other in the world. We should demand to see that reflected back to us in government and in media. And to amplify the voices who don't fit into the stereotypical Alberta image. So thank you, Ryan and Sam, for doing your part in raising those voices loudly and proudly. And for challenging our perceptions. That from Tanya. This was sent in now 45 minutes ago. I read it when it was sent in. It's a fantastic email. What did you make of it? What do you make of it? What do I make of it? Because you know I'm about to take this somewhere. Oh, okay. Uh, What do I make of it? Um... In in short, I mean, first of all, I love talking to Kelly Thompson there. I, I just think it, it, CEO means you're in charge of a company. It doesn't mean you're an old white man. And and I feel like we need to constantly prove that that anybody can be in charge of a company. It's not a title exclusive. The C-seat is, the suite is not exclusively reserved for old white men. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the, the perception in Alberta is that it, it still is and, and it's not. And, you know... Uh, she's spot on because she says it limits growth. I would I would also like to point out that there's room for old white guys on the show. Sure. Mm-hmm. 
I was talking to somebody yesterday. As a matter of fact, it was a job interview. We're hiring a Chase producer, as you may know. And we have conducted eight of ten Ooh. job interviews as we make our way through an incredible short list. Uh, I was going to say, because I don't, I, I'm blind to this process. So as I'm, you should I'm, be. As I should be, yeah. I'm just sort of over here. I don't know who the candidates are. I don't know who the applicants are. I don't know. Okay, let me read the list. No, I'm just... <laughs> Yeah, but, let's read it, read it live on the air. Let's out but I was everybody. talking to I was talking to one of our candidates yesterday, who's a strong candidate, and she said to me, she said, "Yeah, one of the things that concerned me," she said, "I was, um, and I don't think she'll mind me bringing this up." The show's called Real Talk. She said, um, "I was really concerned a while back when she said you you brought on a guest who was in a position to speak with authority on a subject," and she said, "And your comments were going crazy." about an old white guy and get the old white and she said that really concerned me and she said i'm really concerned about the state of discourse right now and i said i share your concern and then a couple hours later i promoted the fact that today we're going to be talking about whether or not there's an ingrained bias in academia against conservatives and the minute that i posted this people started going crazy yeah and, and, and twitter and went on fire twitter's going crazy including some people that should know better mm-hmm who I'm going to name by name today on the show, like Dr. Lee Scotell, uh, a professor of gender studies and women's studies at the University of Alberta. Um, they're critical because the three people that we're going to welcome to the show are all men. And I'm just going to hit this head on right now. Uh, they said this is a mantle. It's a, that's a panel made of men. And somebody really clever came up with this is a mantle, Ryan. You need to do better. It's a mantle. And if I was on the radio as opposed to, <clears throat> you know, recording a podcast or live on YouTube, I mean, we're independent. So right now, quite frankly, like I can say whatever the fuck I want to say because it's my podcast and I can do whatever the fuck I want to do on the podcast. So I'm going to talk about it right now and I'm going to confront it right now. We have had to this point this week on the show, 10 women and two men. Ten women and two men. Now you're going to say, yeah, but it was International Women's Day, so you can't really count that show, Right. Okay, so then evaluate us on Tuesday and Wednesday, and now you know, right? And then, the, and and then, and then you want to look at the panel. I want to make it. Let's make this a bit of an awkward conversation because it's a weird thing to point out. But one of our panelists today is biracial. One of our panelists today is Asian, and then one of our panelists. Today, I, I apologize, everybody, but he's white. And everybody's upset that there's a panel of three men here today. These are three experts in their fields, three people. And, and when you put a panel together, for those of you, for the 99.5% of you that have not worked in production of talk shows, here's how it goes. You come up with an idea, and then you identify who you think might be the best voice to get on that, and then you put in those asks. And when you do a show every day... You put in these out. Can you? Do I feel a little ornery right now? Can you tell I'm a little ornery right now? Do I feel a little bit tense just right a, now? Just a bit. When you put a show together every day, you put in asks, and you do your best to line up a show with guests that people will show up for, right? Like, if you're going to listen to Real Talk every single day, and I'm going to bring in the same five guests, and they're all, like, from my own backyard, and I know them all, and I have them on speed dial, and I say, well, back to the political scientist that everybody knows to talk about, you're going to lose interest. You're not going to tune in. So, like, our guest from Arkansas, who's going to try, is he ready to go? By the way, I should make sure that I get to him in a second. Mm -hmm. He's going to hear me go off like this, and he's going to be like, what did I get myself into? So we work hard to put this show together and we line up guests as best we can. And sometimes I apologize in so many ways, for example, as on Tuesday, not International Women's Day, when we brought on three physicians to, who happened to all be women. And it was weird because I didn't get anybody at that time complaining that there were no men represented on the panel. It was really strange. Nobody was concerned about the fact that there were no men on that panel. Or when we brought in, uh, you know, Alberta mayors uh, the other week. And all three of them were women. It was, it was strange because nobody was concerned that there were no male mayors on the show. Nobody was, seemed to be concerned about that. I'm not sure that anybody actually noticed it because we didn't spell it out and point it out like I am now. In crass fashion, I'll admit. People don't understand what it's like to put a show together. And people also don't understand that 
to take pot shots and take one show or one hour of one show and point it out and say, that's a mantle, like Dr. Lee Scotel is doing from her platform at the University of Alberta, telling me that I can do better. And quite frankly, out of the gates today, I'm sick of it. I'm sick and tired of it. I'm sick and tired of the fact that right now I'm getting ripped apart by the absolute buffoons at a progressive media outlet in Alberta. I'm not even going to name them because it'll make them more famous. And I, and I think that they're upset. I think that they're upset that we have gained more traction in three months than they have in three years, these guys. But out of nowhere yesterday, taking big swipes at our show because we're going to talk about the fact that, you know, whether or not there's an ingrained bias in academia against conservatives. They're not smart enough to recognize that of the three guests that we've booked, the deck is stacked. I'm going to spell this out for you. The deck is stacked against conservatives, you dummies. If you take a look at the panel, but you're afraid of the conversation. You're afraid of having the conversation of whether or not there's an ingrained bias in academia against conservatives. You're afraid to even talk about it. This show is called Real Talk, and we will have real conversations with guests that have earned the right to be on the show. And some shows, they're going to be all women. And some shows, they might even be all white. Some shows, they might be all men. Some shows, they might be all visible minorities. Some shows, they might be all straight. Some shows, they might be all... LGBTQ2S+. Evaluate our body of work. Evaluate the commitment that we walk the talk every single day. And that's real talk. And, I, you know, quite frankly, I couldn't talk about this stuff on the radio. I couldn't say this. I couldn't dismiss people like I did yesterday as a bunch of dumb fucks on my Twitter because I'm so fucking sick of this shit. But I'm going to say it now because I can say it now because we've earned the right and it's a podcast. and I've had enough of it. And the more that we are, the, the more that we are skittish and afraid and adverse to these types of conversations, the worse off we are. And there's going to be one show at the very least one show. And it's this one that will continue to push forward despite your cries and protests and have conversations that actually matter to people. And that includes today. And we're going to have a great show. This show is made possible by a presenting sponsor at Bitcoin. Well, if you're paying attention to crypto in 2021, you know that the story of Bitcoin is an unbelievable one to watch. And you're probably having a bit of a difficult time sorting it all out if you have questions that need to be answered i mean i'm not even saying right now take your life savings and invest that's not what i'm saying i'm saying if you have questions and you need to figure out what what blockchain is or what a hardware wallet is or or what's ethereum does that make sense where does bitcoin fit into the mix for you look up the team at bitcoin well under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. If you're a fan of Dr. Seuss and his work, you may be paying attention to the fact that all of a sudden, some of these Dr. Seuss books are worth thousands of dollars. Dr. Seuss Enterprises has announced a plan to cease publication and licensing of six books that are deemed to be racist. And popular online retail websites and private groups are seeing a rise in ads. They're selling the titles with resale costs uh, $500, $1,000, $2,000 each. As a matter of fact, some private sellers are listing copies on Amazon.ca of Miguel Gott's Pool, Scrambled Egg Super, and If I Ran the Zoo for $3,000 plus. Jacob Held is a professor of philosophy. He's the assistant provost for academic assessment at the University of Central Arkansas. His academic focus tends towards issues in political and legal theory, and he's the editor of a comprehensive analysis of of the philosophy of Dr. Seuss. We are thrilled, Professor, that you've made time to talk to us this morning. Welcome to Real Talk. Welcome to Canada, my friend. 
Thanks very much for having me. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to be on. What was it about Dr. Seuss that 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 intrigued you so that 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 had you publish uh, your works? What drew you to the works of Dr. Seuss? Well, aside from the fact that I'm a parent and just enjoy reading Dr. Seuss, it's just fun. Um, as a teacher of philosophy, the thing that my students often struggle with is penetrating impenetrable works. And I thought if I can use Dr. Seuss, a, a narrative they're familiar with to help communicate complex philosophical issues, then all the better. Because the more uh, discourse we have over these issues, the, the more ability we have to discuss things in an intelligent, critical way, the better we are as a society. So people can go, people can right now go on to Amazon or, or ask their favorite bookstore to order in Dr. Seuss and Philosophy. Oh, the thinks you can think, which which you edited as you take a look at the works of Dr. Seuss and then now take a look at the headlines. See people talking about racist overtones or, or overt racism in the works of Dr. Seuss. Is this something that's been on your radar for a while? Is this is this assessment of his work fair, first of all? Well, it's anyone who who looks at Dr. Seuss's, uh, you know, Theodore Geisel's entire canon knows that this has always been an issue, specifically with regards to the propaganda work he did for the U.S. government. So his cartoons during that period of time do have right caricatures, offensive caricatures of um, of Asians, right, specifically Japanese. Uh, he has works that do have clear racist overtones in his early corpus, but when you take a holistic approach, which I think is important, when you try and understand a person's work and a body of work and the value of those works in a grander scheme, you know, the majority of the works we think about when we think about Dr. Seuss, the narrative he pushes is anti-totalitarian, anti-authoritarian, anti-racist, anti-discriminatory. And so, you know, when you read Sneetches, you're, you're, you're getting a, a good message about, I would say, anti-discrimination, about anti-racism, about equality and dignity. Horton Hears a Who does the same thing. You know, Horton Hatches an Egg is about compassion and care. So I think the overall narrative of Dr. Seuss is incredibly laudable, and that's why we read it to children. So when I see a focus on particular illustrations that need to be understood in, in, a, in a historical context, um, and that and that becomes a way to kind of paint the author or paint the works as a whole. I, I, I think it's myopic. I think it's a, a, a narrow way to look at, at the value of his work. And I think ultimately looking at culture through that lens leads to a real uh, chilling effect on our ability to have open and free discourses and ultimately makes consuming culture not about having discussions of ideas, but about I got you, right? About who can I condemn for some sort of offensive uh, slight or uh, misstatement they made in the past. So in other words, uh, let me assume, I, I don't want to assume, but 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 let me suggest that I, I'm going to guess that you're not thrilled with the decision by these publishers to cease the release of these six books. Am I right on that? Or do you think that on these six, can you see an angle where you think it might be the right call? I think, I think there are alternative avenues that would have been more constructive. Um, I, I think when you look at the illustrations, it's clear that they are unsens insensitive. Um, the depiction of uh, Asians in, in things like if I ran the zoo or scrambled egg super, I believe that's one of them. Um, they, they are caricatures, right? They're the kind of caricature of Asian culture that you see in like Scooby-Doo, Where Are You cartoons in the 70s, the kind of Charlie Chan um, imagery. It, it's, it, it's, it's insensitive. Um, now, whether or not you remove the book is a decision the publisher makes. I think a more constructive avenue would have been to simply on those pages have a disclaimer that set, you know, that indicates the context when this was authored, when this was drawn, and that sensitivities have changed since then, or a disclaimer at the beginning of the book. Um, these files, I guarantee you, are digital. They could have simply altered the artwork and then put a disclaimer in the book that said some images have been altered to reflect a, a greater racial sensitivity. Um, I, I think that leaves the ideas, the concepts, the, the artwork as a whole um, available w without um, removing it from the discourse. And that's what I think is problematic is people will respond and say, well, they only took away six Dr. Seuss books. They were lesser known. All the other books are still available. And it's a private corporation. They have a right to do it. It's not government censorship. But when the norm 
or cultural acceptance is on when a presentation in an artwork or any other art, art, art is deemed offensive by some, we remove it totally from view. I think that's unhealthy. I think it's unhealthy because it harkens to me back to like a George Orwell quote from 1984. The language, right, the revolution will be complete when the language is perfect. Our language will never be perfect. We'll never have a totally ideologically purified discourse, nor should we want one. Um, and so I think this, this tendency to silence, this tendency to disappear works that are now deemed offensive, it's, it's an unworkable standard and ultimately, I think, a dangerous one. Professor, we asked you to come on here and, and talk about Dr. Seuss, but I mean, I mean, you're a doctor of philosophy, so I, I suspect we can we can veer outside of of his body of work. I mean, you know, I'm I'm looking at a list right now of of books that have been banned from schools in Canada and the United States. Not every school, obviously, but many. We're talking about classics: The Great Gatsby, The Catcher in the Rye, The Grapes of Wrath, To Kill a Mockingbird. The Color Purple, Ulysses, Beloved, The Lord of the Flies, the list goes on. Are you concerned about this trend? I mean, more generally speaking, this extends beyond Dr. Seuss. This extends beyond illustrations. And there are different reasons behind each of these books being pulled from library shelves. These are kids that aren't going to read the work of F. Scott Fitzgerald and, and J.D. Salinger and John Steinbeck and, and William Golding and others. Um, in my mind, that's problematic. I, I think it is problematic as well. Um, and for this reason, if if we start selectively taking out works that we find offense or that we anticipate or predict other people might find offense in, um, that kind of standard is unworkable in the sense that if the, if the way in which you gauge whether or not a work is offensive is whether or not somebody might be offended by it, everything's on the table. And, and, and a little anecdote, the other day I was in my office and I was, you know, reading articles about Dr. Seuss and, and what was going on. And I was listening to Pandora and on came the Dire Straits, specifically Money for Nothing off the Brothers in Arms album. And in that song, Mark Knopfler uses a, a derogatory term for homosexuals, right? He uses the F word. I won't say it just because I don't want to be a lightning rod, um, even though the context I think would merit. But um, he, he, right, he says that little F word with the earring and the mink coat, right? Yeah, that's his own hair. That little F word has his own jet airplane. That little F word is a millionaire. And I think of that song and I go, not only would that not pass muster today, but I could see a lobby arguing that Pandora remove it, that mm -hmm. Spotify remove it, yeah. that places not sell brothers in arms anymore. And it's not to say that the dire straits is so uniquely valuable that we need to die on that hill, but it is to say that something like that, which in the context, Mark Knopfler is putting in the mouth of a blue collar working class individual to express the frustration that, right, somebody like Boy George, who was big in the 80s, was a, was a millionaire. He's putting it in their mouth to make them sound crass and to make them sound, right, resentful and so on there's an artistic context that makes it not derogatory, that makes it not inflammatory. Mark Knopfler is not a homophobe, as far as I know, right? And he could sing that song and not be a homophobe. But once we move to those lyrics are offensive, hide them from view, remove them, right? Those illustrations are offensive, hide them from view, remove them. We do have to wonder about where this goes across culture, even if it's not even if it's not governmental intervention and censorship, the fact that there's downward pressure from culture, uh, from a particular ideological view, that this kind of language needs to be silenced, that anybody who uses it is somehow right on the outs or should be ostracized, is problematic because it, it inhibits our ability to have difficult conversations. It inhibits our ability to, to discuss and, and, and engage culture in a meaningful way way you know when when the dr seuss books were pulled ebay i believe started pulling listings for some of the the discontinued books saying they violated its offensive policy at the same time they pulled that i could go on ebay and buy a swastika 
I could go on eBay and buy something emblazoned with a Confederate flag. So if they're going to be consistent, everything has to go. I think that's particularly problematic and damaging. So the issue then is how do we deal with offensive works that is both sensitive to the people who are offended, but also doesn't in a real way inhibit our ability to have a free and open discourse. We've got some uh, <clears throat> some of our viewers that are watching us live, Professor, this morning on YouTube uh, that are pointing out, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll read one comment here from Lost Cult Music who says, just a note that Mark Knopfler has been subbing out that line in concerts for about 20 years now. Uh, Dar Straits concerts. You know what it's reminding me of? It's reminding me of Baby It's Cold Outside. Uh, I worked at a, at a terrestrial radio station uh, part of that held FM radio properties as well up until a short time ago. And I remember the email going out it was like late october early november to all staff that our radio stations would be joining we would be joining the the groups that were uh, you know coming forth and, and we were accused at the time i mean i say we the collective we i had nothing to do with the decision and i was a talk host obviously but we would not be playing baby it's cold outside because of its its rapey vibes uh, that was not the corporate phrasing that they used, but but it was the same sort of a thing where a lot of people were really critical of the radio stations for virtue signaling and for towing the line of the cancel culture armies. Um, and at the same time, other people were saying, if, you know, if you read the lyrics to that song about like, you know, stay a little longer, have another drink. I mean, I don't have the lyrics in front of me, but basically like, you know, have a sip of this. Uh, you know, I mean, it sort of had that Bill Cosby kind of a feel to it. Um, people were saying, of course, that type of song should not be, you know, uh, you know, perpetuated. And then other versions have come out. I mean, I, I think of you know, Michael Buble, the Canadian crooner, has done a version of it. And I'm sure others have swapping out the lyrics. Some of our viewers this morning are suggesting that, you know, the Dr. Seuss books could be re-released with different artwork. How would you feel about that? Yeah, I think, you know, a case like Mark Knopfler, um, I'm glad he subbed out the line. I, I mean, singing that line nowadays is offensive. It'd be right? weird. And it would be weird. And, and I think it would be unfortunate because it would alienate, a, 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 you know, the LGBT community unnecessarily um, from from his music. So so I'm glad he subs that out. That's the choice he made as an artist. And I think it's the right choice. You know, the band Alabama's done the same thing. They don't use the Confederate flag anymore as part of their PR material, as their symbolism and so on, even though a lot of their classic albums have it emblazoned on the front, you know, and they did that because they recognize that the Confederate flag is interpreted and understood by many uh, to be racially divisive. So um, I completely support that as well. I think there's nothing wrong with being sensitive to changing sensibilities and recognizing that your, your, your imagery, your voice has an impact on how people understand their place in a culture. My concern is when the goal is some sort of ideological purity and we're playing this game of let's try and get everything we can find that's possibly offensive out. Because at that point, the standard is so broad that I'm concerned that even people who are having beneficial, fruitful, constructive conversations on these topics are going to be fearful about talking about them because they'll be worried that they'll be painted as somebody who's saying something offensive. And, and as I mentioned when we began, you know, there are other alternatives they could have done with the Seuss book. I artwork and then even putting in a note that the artwork has been altered from the original and explaining why would be an incredibly educative move, would be beneficial. You would still have the work available to children, available to everybody, and you would have a lesson in sensitivity and how to move forward constructively by saying we simply altered the artwork. And since the Dr. Seuss Enterprises owns right the the right to these things, it has the authority to do that. And I don't even think I mean, I mean as much as you can put intentions into people's minds, you know, given the message of the Dr. Seuss works, I think he would probably be sympathetic to that. I, I I'm you know if he lived nowadays and somebody said, could you redraw this page because that depiction of an Asian is really offensive. I have, it hard, I have a hard time imagining that the author of Horton Hears a Who would say, no, I really enjoy that caricature of Asians and right. I want to keep it in there. Yeah, well said. Uh, we've got some incredible, I mean, I, I feel like I should sit here for half an hour and read the comments we're getting right now. Um, some, some intuitive and insightful 
commentary happening as we speak. Mike says, I mean, what if you kept these books, though, in English class, you know, to appreciate the literary accomplishments and then linked them to a class where students could talk about what makes them socially inappropriate. Kim says if a publisher chooses to stop publishing books for whatever reason, that happens all the time. It's it's their choice. It's progress. It's not cancel culture. Lorraine says, and, and this leads to the question uh, that I'm really curious to know how you're going to take this, Professor. Lorraine says, I must be very cynical. I don't think Lorraine is. I think she might be onto something. She says, but, but did the publisher maybe do this to boost sales? I mean, nobody was calling for these books to be removed, and the sales went through the roof right after the announcement. I mean, they're selling, or I, I should say they're listed in some cases for up to $3,000 for pristine copies. What do you think? What do you make of the trend here? Yeah, I I don't think cynicism is a helpful interpretive paradigm to read people's actions through. Even though it might be true a lot of the times, I don't think it's constructive. Um, so I, I would say let's assume that Dr. Seuss Enterprises was acting with integrity here and, and really said the, these depictions, you know, we had a committee, they looked at them and, and they're offensive, you know, and so we want to remove them. Um, if we assume they did it in good faith, I, I don't dispute their right to do it. They have a right as the publisher to do it, but having a right to do something doesn't mean that doing it is morally laudable. And, and that's what my concern is, is that, you know, as we have private enterprises and vendors moving to, right, remove offensive things and so on, just because it's not the government doing it doesn't mean it's still not stifling on discourse, doesn't mean it still doesn't have an impact. Because when people are going to publish with a publisher, when they're going to write something, when they're going to engage in some sort of artistic uh, endeavor, that's going to be in the back of their head. Are they going to be deemed offensive? Are they going to have a place to land this? It, it reminds me very much of the PMRC trials of the music industry, right? The, the Parental Media Resource uh, Center and, and Frank Zappa's um, testimony to that, which I think is prescient, right? And, and, and it's something, if people have never seen Frank Zappa testify before Congress for the PMRC, they should see it because what he says is relevant today, as relevant as any time. And his concern was that if you label albums with this parental advisory, it's going to have a chilling effect on art. It's it's going to label certain artists as obscene or offensive, it, and it's going to have an impact on how people produce. Um, even if the record company willfully does that without government intervention, it still has that impact. And so the publisher has a right to restrict and publish whatever it wants. That's always been the case. Uh, they, they follow different rules and, and can follow different rules than a government agency, but it still is from a moral point of view and, and from a cultural point of view, a way in which the discourse and the dialogue is regulated. And so it should still be evaluated by the same criteria. We should ask whether or not this is a beneficial or harmful way in which to restrict our discourse, in which to restrict our dialogue. Are there more fruitful, productive ways to engage these things? And I think there are. Professor Jacob Held, uh, Assistant Provost for Academic Assessment and General Education and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Central Arkansas and a definitive voice on the body of work by, what's his name again? Theodore Seussel? Geisel. Theodore Geisel. Theodore Geisel, Dr. Seuss. Jacob, thanks so much for making time for us. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, you bet. Uh, you can check out uh, Professor Held's work, uh, Dr. Seuss and Philosophy. Oh, the thinks you can think. Uh, that's a piece the, or, or rather a publication that he edited. Uh, we're going to get into whether or not there's academic bias at universities in, in Canada. Um, it's kind of funny. A lot of you uh, wrote in uh, or responded to my tweet about it saying, uh, yes. Yes, there is. Next question. I thought, yeah, that's not how talk shows work. That's not how talk shows work. So It'd we're going to talk really it out. Short, really boring show. Wouldn't it be really it short? Really, if we, yeah. if we just did yes, no answers to everything. Is racism <laughs> is racism a problem in Canada? Yes. Next question. <laughs> Should we solve homelessness? Yes. Next question. Do we need to listen to these voices around cancel culture? No. Next question. <laughs> Thankfully, we have these conversations and they're made possible because of teams like Park Power who continue to support us day in and day out. 
despite the protest of some loud voices on social media. If you go to parkpower.ca right now and enter the promo code 2021-realtalk, I don't know what was in my cereal this morning, but I am just ornery fiery today i am fiery yeah and i'm now shirt on maybe that's it it is the skull shirt yeah that might be it i looked in the mirror this morning and i thought i'm gonna bring the thunder baby uh if you go to parkpower.ca and if you enter the promo code 2021 dash real talk right now you're gonna save 70 bucks off your first bill whether it's natural gas internet electricity or all of it for well your residential or your commercial setup park power is proud to support the communities in which they live and operate, and so they take 10% of their profits and they put them back into the non-profits, and you can find out which groups they're supporting by following them on basically every social media platform. Park Power, for for a natural gas and internet and electricity company, Park Power does an unbelievable job on social media. Make sure you follow them. I especially enjoy their Instagram. Oh, it's uh, fantastic. Isn't it good? It's so bright and vibrant. And I want to... Like, yeah, it, it's, like, it's, it's a fun time. I like you say bright and vibrant. Their brand That's sort is, of their brand. It's very v- bright and vibrant. Very strong brand yeah. i'd love to someday we'll talk to whoever does their branding whoever does their social media because they're doing an amazing job the team at Friesen brothers is really excited to be open finally finally in edmonton if you live in the south side of edmonton and if you're traveling up rabbit hill road or the anthony henda you've probably you've been watching this store under construction for like two years it feels like well now it's open and you can you can head in there and check out. I mean, every day I want to tell you something new about it. They have a they have a whole corner of the store dedicated to their sourdough cinnamon buns. There's an entire section for cinnamon buns. Let me repeat: there is an entire section for cinnamon buns. They have their sourdough starter. I don't know if it has a name, but they've had this starter for years and years and years. As a matter of fact, it's famous sourdough made from Alberta milled flour. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. Also want to give a shout out to the team at Kubi Energy. Jake from Kubi Energy is going to be joining us tomorrow. Tomorrow at 9 o'clock Mountain, 11 o'clock Eastern, our solar panel will take on green energy and i'm very much looking forward to this conversation jake has a background are you, i know sam's so of course excited i'm excited that. about this how like how could i not be excited about sam this? tell us the truth do you have a working document that that is working to implement solar into your residential setup i suspect i've done the research i've had course, some quotes of course you have i love it what's stopping you the price right now. Yeah. And yeah. you know what? That's got to be one of the things we talk about tomorrow. Absolutely. Because it keeps getting cheaper. It does keep getting cheaper. You're right. But uh, it's still, pro- we'll ask Jay, we'll ask our panelists about this tomorrow. I think it's, it's like 25, 30 grand for the average house. Yeah. And people want to know, well, am I going to get the money back? The team at Kubi Energy. Ooh, I like this. We, we, we ran out of music on the other track, so I had to slide into another changed one. Changed it up a little bit, and All we've right. got three panelists right now that are like, when the hell is he going to bring us in so we they're, can talk They're about, getting ready to leave. Yeah, They're, they're, they're all getting ready to yeah. leave. You know, so we better wrap this up quickly. The team at Kubi Energy knows that you have questions about things like price and efficiency and, and ROI. Obviously, you're going to be concerned about that. They love to talk solar, and you can find them at kubienergy.ca. They are Tesla certified. All right, let's get to this. You hear it all the time. You hear it mostly from politicians, quite frankly, that there's bias uh, on university campuses. Now, you, you, from from most people, I think, at least based on what I've seen, people are arguing that there's bias against conservatives. Maybe some might argue that there's a bias against the left, too. We'll find out. Christopher Dummett, as a matter of fact, has has written about this in the National Post just a short time ago at the beginning of March, and I'm really excited that he's agreed to join us. Uh, professor Dummett is uh, a professor of Canadian history at Trent University, and he's host of the Canadian History Podcast. I'm actually excited to see his face when I, when I tell him this. It is the first podcast that I ever subscribed to in my life. Swear on the Bible. 1867 and all that. It's the first podcast I ever subscribed to. He's the author of several books, including Unbuttoned, A History of Mackenzie King's Secret Life. Dr. Jared Wesley is a professor of political science and a friend of this show, and I'm uh, and I'm really looking forward to picking his brain because as he tweeted the other day, Dr. Wesley's a graduate. He holds degrees from the University of Calgary and the University of Alberta. And the word on the street is that those two universities lean in different directions so I'm, I'm looking forward to his take on whether or not there's bias uh steven Zhao is a freelance investigative journalist in toronto covering politics discrimination 
and the far right. And you can read his work on Vice, Foreign Policy, the CBC, and numerous other outlets. Uh, Gentlemen, to the three of you, thank you so much for joining us this morning and welcome to Real Talk. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Uh, Professor Dummett, why don't we start with you? Because it's your piece in the National Post that caught our attention. You argue the results are in. There is an ingrained bias in academia against conservatives. I want to encourage our panelists to feel free to interact with one another. You don't have to wait for me to ask you a question to speak up. But but Christopher, what's the argument? All right. Well, I mean, the argument I make is just because there was a new report, which kind of uh, kind of was based on extensive uh, surveys across the United States, the United Kingdom, and, uh, you know, a little bit of Canadian data, some, the best Canadian data we have so far. And it asked a couple of things. It asked, for example, you know, where do people kind of situate themselves on, on the left and right? And there were various, you know, gradations they could have between left and right. Uh, and the evidence showed that, you know, the, the most striking evidence was in the social sciences and humanities, uh, that it was like 73% of people who teach in the social sciences and humanities of the sample size said they identified on the left and only 4% identified on the right. Uh, so that's that's one thing. And, you know, it, it's a little bit slightly different if you include STEM and these other areas, but still, even if you include those areas, about a 10 to 1 uh, ratio. And there's not a great deal of Canadian data. This is the best we have, but it, it's pretty consistent across a whole bunch of surveys that have been done before in the US, the UK and Europe. So you see this consistently, but it's really obvious in the social sciences and the humanities. So the evidence is there and kind of this incredible skew. Um, and it's important because I, I, I remember having these conversations with people before and, and, and they would just deny it. Uh, it's a pretty common technique to say, oh, no, this isn't true. This, is, this isn't, there's no evidence for this, even though there's, you know, pretty significant and serious and, and pretty compelling evidence. And then the report also showed to try to think about what, you know, why does this matter? And to try to say, is, is there actually examples of discrimination and how many people would discriminate? Uh, would they try and cancel someone? Would they, were there consequences? I mean, there's some good news in the report, which says that it's only a minority of people who would openly admit to discriminating against uh, people uh, who have opposing political views. And, and, and the other reference is that both people on the left and the right are both equally willing to do this. So it's not as if one side can claim virtue. Uh, but uh, the impact of this in an institution which is overwhelmingly dominated by people on the left, it means that people who identify as conservative or people who do scholarship and especially in the social science and humanities, this is obvious, which has political leanings, which has political implications. And it's usually pretty obvious uh, in what they're doing that the, the chance that any single person will be discriminated against uh, uh, for virtue of their political beliefs is really quite high. If you think about when they go and they submit a publication, it's got to, have to be reviewed by the editor and then all these different reviewers. And the odds then that uh, someone will face political discrimination are quite high. I mean, I could go on, but it's it, it, it's a pretty compelling report. Well, and I'll invite you to go on through the course of of the next forty five minutes or so, Doctor Wesley. Do you see it? I mean, obviously, you've earned degrees. You've you've been on different campuses. I mean, even if we're just we're expanding our conversation, obviously outside of Alberta, but the two universities from from which you've earned degrees, uh, you quite rightfully point out, the University of Calgary is is recognized as 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 I think the birthplace of of almost Canadian conservatism. If you look at Tom Flanagan and Stephen Harper, and if you look at some of the voices that have come out, Ezra Levant of the University of Calgary, you look at the reputation the University of Alberta has, some might argue it leans left. Um, do you ad- agree or disagree with what you're hearing from Professor Dummett? Well, I mean, it might just be a disciplinary difference, but, um, you know, Professor Dummett's talking about the odds are that folks will face discrimination. And um, while the numbers are low in this sample size, we should be able to make, uh, c- draw conclusions from it. That's not my training. Um, if we're dealing with a sample size of under 300 for the entire country, that raises huge red flags for me and probably suggests why this study wasn't actually peer reviewed. You don't have to be, you know, progressive to deny that that small a sample size isn't large enough to draw conclusions. I think the, the broader issue I have with the interpretation of that meager bit of data is that um, simply because someone may identify as being on the left side of the political spectrum, doesn't mean that they have an anti-conservative bias, right? I mean, we're, we're jumping from, I place myself on the left to I'm not going to uh, positively peer review a piece that disagrees with my leanings. There's a gulf there that political scientists study. Uh, so, I mean, I, I guess my, my broad, and I'll get, I'll get into my own personal experience at, at, at the U of University of Calgary and University of Alberta. I'm happy to share that. But I think it's important to remember that's what we're left with. 
in the absence of any kind of comprehensive data, we're left with anecdotes and, and personal experiences at these various institutions. When you first tweeted about today's episode, um, I don't think my feed's blown up like that in a while with people sharing their experiences. Well, I was at the University of Calgary and I experienced this. Well, I didn't experience that, but I was 10 years earlier and so on. That's what we're going on. And my worry as a political scientist is that we're making a lot of assumptions and stereotyping people um, based on based on those types of anecdotes. So th that's the way I'll preface it. Um, so as you said, I, I did my undergrad at the University of Alberta. Um, I moved there from small town Manitoba. Um, unlike many people who have this impression that uh, you know, people self-select into universities at undergrad, I went to the U of A because they offered me money. All right. Alberta at the time, this is a long time ago, so some of your listeners may not know this, Alberta actually had money. <laughs> and they were throwing money uh, at folks from the rest of Canada to come and study there. That's why I came there. I had no expectations. I can tell you, as a person of mixed race walking into classrooms, my first impression wasn't whether my prof was conservative or, or progressive or not. It was they don't look like people that that I'm used to that I'm used to being around. I didn't see anybody that looked like my dad, for instance. We had two black faculty members at the time. We still have two black faculty members twenty years later. Um, I saw a lot of old white guys, right? And our department was probably one of the more uh, you know more gender diverse at the time uh, than most. But that that's what I saw. That was my first impression. It wasn't until I got through my degree that I realized how that actually impacts the way I look at politics. And that's what you see in a lot of these classrooms. It's exposure to a lot of different viewpoints. I, I went to the University of Calgary and did uh, my PhD there where I was exposed to a, a, a lot of uh, conservative thought that I may not have seen um, in, my, in, in my days at the U of A or University of Manitoba where I did my master's. And that enriched the environment. Um, and, but I gotta say, I, I've never been, uh, uh, you know, I've never been attacked because of my own political views. Uh, my own political views have evolved through the course of my through the course of my training. I came from a small town in Manitoba, hard not to be a conservative, honestly, um, and, and came to University of Alberta, met with other conservatives, met with other progressives, changed my worldview and approached the world in in in, in a different way as a result. So. Um, you know, and I've taught in both. So I've had students at the University of Calgary and University of Alberta and uh, a wide, wide diversity of views there as well. Uh, you can ask my students, they'd be better to ask whether I'm marking them down because I feel like they don't espouse to the same ideological viewpoint as me. I, I don't think I do. I value arguments over opinions. Um, but I think the biggest difference I saw between U of C and U of A in terms of the students is who, who's playing the underdog, honestly. In these classroom dynamics where we have conservatives, conservative students and progressives debating public policy issues from healthcare to same-sex marriage and so on, um, at the University of Calgary, the conservatives uh, got their backs up a bit and enjoyed the un uh, enjoyed the um, sorry I should say progressives got their backs up a bit and enjoyed the underdog status that came with being a progressive at the University of Calgary. And I see exactly the opposite happening here at the University of Alberta. And it has a lot to do with the reputations of those institutions, not a lot to do with what actually goes on there. Um, so, I mean, you talked about Tom Flanagan. Tom Flanagan was the first person that I met when I moved to the University of Calgary to mm -hmm. do my PhD. Um, I went to faculty meetings with him, uh, you know, d department socials with him, um, Barry Cooper, Reiner Knopf, Ted Morton. And, and, you know, to this day, I, I can pick up the phone and talk to those folks about stuff in academia, stuff, stuff about their research. I don't feel stigmatized by being not on their side on a lot of these issues. But then I'll get blowback from folks on the progressive side of academia who will say, well, I can't believe you talk to them. I can't believe you give them the time of day. Um, so I guess maybe my own personal, you know, approach to academic training and and my own experience is different than most, but I think we need to start avoiding these types of stereotypes that exist uh, around who academics are um, in, in the classroom, in their research and beyond. That's just me. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. Uh, Ethan has, has written in, uh, he responded to my tweet and I want to get to some of the comments that we're getting from, from uh, you know, viewers and listeners because they're fascinating. Ethan says, all I'm going to say uh, is that I've never met a conservative that felt like they had to keep their political beliefs a secret, uh, which is an interesting interpretation of the question of whether or not there's bias. Stephen, you've been working uh, and you've been keeping an eye on this and, and, and monitoring to a certain degree as an investigative journalist. Um, 
you know, university campuses for several years. Uh, where do you land on this? I mean, is, is the question too general? Is there ingrained bias or is there inherent bias against conservatives uh, or against the left? I want to leave the question open on campuses. What has your research turned up and, and what do you think? Well, yeah, I think the term campus is a general one. And, you know, I've never taught at campuses, which means I, I don't, um, you know, I don't spend any time in faculty meetings. I don't know, uh, you know, what the, the tensions are there between certain, you know, left wing versus right wing um, professors. But um, I think this debate is particularly uh, hot and pertinent in the past five to six years because there's been a kind of new populism or um, a kind of new um, right wing uh, kind of um, swing through the campuses and through North America in general. Um, I, keep, I think you get that has a lot to do with Donald Trump. I think a lot has a lot to do with you know what's happening around the world and um, the liberal establishment losing a lot of credibility for a number of reasons. And campuses are going to be affected by that. Um, whether or not you know that seeps into the to the faculty, I'm sure it does in, in some way. But um, I think there is a, a, a newfound kind of um, bravery among a lot of students in, on campuses to import uh, provocative right-wing perspectives uh, that can be can, can quite fairly be characterized as aligned with the far right, whether it's um, inviting somebody like Charles Murray, which is like the famous case in the United States, but also in, in, um, in Canada, where you have you know, Jordan Peterson uh, trying to do a panel with Faith Boldy, who you know, is on record for saying she wants a white ethno state, and um, they were going to have a panel in Ryerson that got canceled. And um, you know, stuff like that provokes people. It, um, it, mili it, it uh, helps facilitate militancy on the left. And I think you know, we, we see a lot of... Um, incidents that are, you know, sometimes dominate the news cycle of people like Miley Yiannopoulos or uh, Ben Shapiro getting protested against because they say things like, you know, Ben Shapiro at one point said things like, you know, Arabs are um, like to live in open sewage. He, he, he tweeted that. So I think, you know, that that's happening. Um, it's a, a big I think wavering, it, it was bigger maybe three, four years ago, but um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a real thing on campus where the left has is, is become more militant, more, more radicalized. What I do understand, um, and I think this is kind of consistent, at least in part with my, um, my time on campuses, I do speak with a lot of academics and a lot of students who do see um, what they study uh, what they what they experience through a kind of critical theory lens, and I think that, that comes, and uh, that does place them on the left, um, and that does place them um, as uh, identifying as more uh, more on the left because they divide the world into kind of um, whether it's it's rich versus poor or um, cis versus trans or whatever you know the the binary is. Um, there's that that comes from I think. Uh, an internal sort of um, urge to address what they see as a dominant culture on the one side, marginalizing voices on the other side. And I think that the society in general is a lot more, um, is a lot more sensitive to that in, in recent years. And we can get into how, whether or not that's, um, that's, a, you know, the students have gone about it always the best best way or not. But I, I do, I mean, that is that is a, a major sort of perspective on campus. And that is sort of the uh, the way, the worldview that undergirds a lot of the actions by, by students on campus. We Yeah, we can talk about the dynamic on university campuses. I feel like I should approach the conversation, Steve, in the same way you have by acknowledging that I've really not spent any meaningful time on a university campus in, in more than 20 years. And so I'm only speaking uh, essentially from what I glean from anecdotal evidence, what other people say. Uh, Professor Dummett, before I, before I ask you a more focused question, I'd love to give you an opportunity to respond to what you heard from Stephen and from Jared, from Dr. Wesley. 
Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, there's lots to agree in part with there. I mean, I think Jared, I think I'd probably share with him his kind of commitment to diverse viewpoints and actually engaging with people you disagree with. I think it's so, like, that's essentially what universities are supposed to be about. And I'm glad that's been his experience. Um, uh, that's not always the case. I mean, as we know, this kind of wake of cancel culture is meaning that that is kind of, there's a real sense of attack on that. And many people uh, feel, and the surveys show this pretty clearly, that they can't address certain issues. They can't go on to certain issues or else they threat, feel threatened in their career. Uh, I'm a, you know, a, a tenured professor, so I can, I can go on and even talk about this. Um, but many people would, would be afraid to even, even talk about this issue uh, and uh, openly, certainly if they didn't have a, a tenured position already. Um, the data is true. It's, it's a small sample size. Uh, I, I will say that I, I, I might be in the process of rectifying that. So I think we are on to that. Um, but don't let the Canadian data um, uh, fool you in the sense that there have been multiple studies of this exact same phenomenon in countries uh, that are very similar to us that show with huge sample sizes, the, 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 the UK data based on again, YouGov sample size are you know, huge uh, broad population data, which shows exactly this, that there's a fundamental misalignment between the universities, which uh, lean very heavily to the left, overwhelmingly to the left, and the broader population, which just isn't that isn't the case. And this is even different than say, um, you might think that this is something to do with kind of ed educational, ed broader educational levels, people might lean a bit more to the left. And there's some truth in that. But if you look at similar kinds of sectors, uh, it, it's nowhere near as dramatically mis misaligned as the universities are. So we need more Canadian data. And I, I completely agree on that. And I may be in the process of trying to trying to rectify that. But, uh, but there's pretty overwhelming evidence across the board that that's the case. Jared, why is this conversation important? I, I would, that was not going to be my question off the top. Why are we here talking about this? Uh, but but there, there, is a, there are a few points I'd just like to address with Professor Dummett. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm always a proponent of, of more research. I hope we can talk a little bit about how, how we're going about measuring um, bias because the, the American studies in particular are doing a horrible job of it. Um, but I would also like to just, just remind folks that, you know, if, if conservatives on campus um, are, are feeling like uh, – they don't have the license or they don't feel comfortable raising issues or questions uh, in class, uh, I would say that, that those similar constraints exist uh, for folks on, on the opposite side of the spectrum and with different lived experiences, right? So, you know, the, some of the research in the United States is actually showing that um, academics in, in, at lower or, or earlier parts in their careers are less likely now to report being on the left or the right and are likely to identify as moderate and most of that has to do with fear of being branded as a progressive. And that's, that can be a career limiting move, uh, but beyond your career, a lot of women, a lot of uh, people in the BIPOC community uh, face a lot of, of, of you know, outright threats uh, on social media that, that make them less likely to wanna ask the types of questions that they like to, tenure or not. So I think we need, we need to put the concerns of, of conservative academics in a, bit, in a bit of perspective that way. I think Sorry, it's can also I, can worth, I interrupt? Is that, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the surveys do measure that. They ask, uh, you know, how, how much people across the across the board feel that their political opinions don't fit in with an academic culture, um, uh, and the data shows overwhelmingly that large numbers of conservatives feel that expressing their opinions, having those opinions, wouldn't wouldn't fit in with the university culture, and people from the, the different political persuasions don't feel that way to any d degree near the numbers. So I, I mean, listen, we may, maybe a different study. I'd like to see it, but th these studies show pretty clearly that there's a misalignment. And, and just one other thing, it's also not even just conservatives. There's also kind of gender critical feminists. Like one key part of this research was showing that that the gender critical feminists uh, also have the same kinds of concerns. And you know, th th one of the questions asked, you know, wh 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 whether someone would be comfortable having lunch with certain kinds of people. And the 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 the, the person that Canadian academics said they would least be comfortable having lunch with socializing with was a gender critical feminist yeah I, again we're I, I haven't seen that that part of the study and we can we can debate data I guess where we're at where I would like to take it is is how we're actually measuring what we're calling anti-conservative bias right so a lot of the American literature conflates uh, uh, you know, ideological proclivities with partisanship. We know this, right? A lot of these studies that, that put this issue, uh, you know, on, on front pages and have it on podcasts like this are, are showing that Democrats outnumber 
uh, Republicans 10 to 1. The study that you're citing asks people to place themselves on a left-right spectrum, and, and that's, that's fine. I do some of that work in my own research. But I think, you know, the, the better way to look at this is, is not through left and right, but rather through people's mindsets in general, right? So um, you're familiar with this, I'm sure, Professor Dummett, the study that's now been popularized is the Pickup versus Prius study, where they they look at measurements of people's, um, and, and originally they called it authoritarian, authoritarian tendencies. Uh, the authors quickly abandoned that term because authoritarianism comes with a, a lot of baggage. But they, they've, they've instead shifted to terms like fixit, fixity uh, and fluidity. So they find that a lot of people um, in society in general will, will cleave into two groups, people that uh, favor stability and security and predictability and have definite standards. And those people are what we call the people that have a fixed mindset, okay? Um, though there's another group of people uh, that, that have a more fluid worldview, that embrace complexity and search out nuance uh, and, and in, in, in some ways embrace chaos and look to push the envelope. Now, I, I don't think any of us would be surprised to find among social scientists and humanitarians a, a lot of people that, that fit the latter viewpoint, the fluid worldview, right? I don't think we'd be surprised either, and this is a hypothesis, I'd love if you're testing it in, in, in your survey, to find that natural and hard sciences, STEM folks, people in law and business would fit into the more fixed viewpoint um, uh, uh, category or camp. Now, does that mean that all people with fixed views are conservative? No, some of them probably tend in that direction. Does that mean that people with fluid viewpoints tend to be progressive? Maybe, but we're talking about academics. You can have th these, these, these viewpoints uh, really depend on the scenario that, that you, you find yourself in. So you can have researchers that are really pushing the envelope and have a really fluid approach to their research, but they have a very fixed, staid, boring approach to pedagogy, teaching in the classroom. Uh, and if you, if you want to know where the diversity of these two viewpoints that I'm describing, where it really comes out is in department and faculty meetings. <laughs> there are folks who in their day job doing research are, are as progressive as they come, but are as fixed in, on, on procedures and routines as we'd, as we'd find um, in, in, the, in the general population. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to contest that there are more people in the social sciences and, and humanities that have a more fluid viewpoint. I think that's natural. But I, I, natural to assume, but but I think we also have to start asking why we don't find more conservatives um, uh, in faculty positions uh, across uh, uh, across Canada. People with more fixed mindsets, or we might use the term conservative in some cases to ask them. I hope we can delve into that a bit, Ryan, because there's an there's an assumption that that conservatives are being screened out of the process. That this is a gatekeeping problem. That conservative there's a supply of conservatives out there that just simply aren't getting jobs. I'm telling you, I, I, as being members of, of hiring committees and so on, it's not a matter of being screened out. We don't have conservatives that are choosing to, to pursue, um, a, a, you know, an academic career path. And I think there are real reasons why that is. Part of it has to do with that fixed mindset that we find most conservatives have. But part of it has to do with their own uh, desires for other things uh, in their career that they won't find in academia. Yeah. And, and, and let me say and let me reiterate, Dr. Wesley, this conversation can go wherever the hell we want the conversation to go. And I'm hoping that you take it there. I mean, that's the entire point of having this panel. Uh, Stephen, we've got an interesting uh, comment here uh, and it's a fair one. It, it, you know, a, a listener here says, like, who are we talking about? Like, like when we talk about bias and, and when we talk about university campuses, like are we talking about boards, students, student groups? faculty administration who is the they in this discussion what is your investigative journalism turned up well i mean i think the it's it's always nebulous when i i mean i don't talk to a huge amount of administrators but i talk to a ton of students uh, and i talk to a ton of students um, on both sides because that's what my job um, often consists of and I think, you know, the, the people, the students on the left are usually um, respond to something they see in particular in, in, uh, in, on campus or, or off campus. They see something like, you know, this person, this problematic person is trying to convene something um, and they form a kind of like, they form a, an anti-fascist um, 
counter protest or something like that. And we see that quite a bit. And sometimes it's, it's, it's per, you know, pretty staid. And other times um, it can get uh, more, there, it includes fisticuffs. But that, um, that, that violence is, um, is perpetrated on, on by both sides, more or less. And from what I can see, more by people who identify with the far right, because that's what they're, uh, that's what they're to do. But when I talk to students on, on the right who, um, you know, organize men's rights organization, you know, groups, or, you know, they, they organize, uh, you know, uh, students for Western civilization groups and stuff like that. It's really, you know, I, I don't find a, a very much specificity there. They're not saying, oh, my professors or my, this university, they're saying, you know, the world has, has become so that um, my culture or my worldview is being marginalized. And I think, you know, I see that as, 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 a, as a kind of, um, I don't know how that necessarily compares to, to the conversations that professors or administrators have in their, their meetings. But um, I, I would imagine that uh, it's it's not um, it's it's not necessarily the same thing. So when we talk about campus, uh, I mean, are we talking about students? Are we talking about uh, professors? And also, I, I'd like to know like exactly what opinions um, in you know by conservative scholars or by conservative professors uh, do they find? being tossed aside in these in these uh, academic processes um you know that i i just i just don't really know that okay i want to ask the same uh, question to professor dummett in just a second and plus we'll circle back on on uh, dr wesley's question which is where are the conservatives uh, first want to take a really quick moment to remind you that these conversations are made possible by the builders that keep real talk moving along this journey of meaningful conversations and sinking our teeth into stuff that actually makes us think that roster of builders includes the team at McBain camera, which has been Alberta's best destination for photographers and content creators for decades they invite you right now to shop safely at one of their six convenient Alberta locations, or you can live chat with one of their team members at McBainCamera.com. While you're there, ask them about the Nikon Z50 camera. This is an opportunity to get stunning 4K Ultra HD with 1080p slow motion, time-lapse mode, and a whole lot more. Plus, it has the LCD screen that flips down to activate self-portrait mode, which is perfect if you're taking selfies or if you're vlogging, if you're getting set to start your own media empire you're going to want to make sure you get your hands on a nikon z50 body or kit at mcbainecamera.com and when you do enter the promo code real talk just one word together real talk and they're going to give you a free pro master hitchhiker tabletop tripod included in your order also a big shout out to the team at eden landscaping at landscapeedmonton.ca you can check out the work that they've been doing their body of work extends over two decades they've been helping people's visions their dreams for their outdoor space come true so for you whether it's that that fence that needs to be rebuilt maybe you need a retaining wall or maybe you've always wanted one of those outdoor kitchens with one of the fancy Sam Brooks pergolas over well, time. I also want the outdoor kitchen. You badly. Want the, maybe we can talk to the team at Eden Landscaping. Oh, yeah. See what we can work out here, my man. Uh, they're ready to go for you right now. And a big part of what they do and what they're proud to do is they help design the project. Plus, they build it. So you're not hiring anybody else. You don't have to play general contractor yourself. You can check out Eden Landscaping at landscapeedmonton.com. A, a great conversation right now with uh, Stephen Zhao, an investigative journalist, Dr. Jared Wesley, and of course, our guest, uh, Professor Christopher Dummett, uh, the author of an opinion piece in the National Post last week. The results are in. There is an ingrained bias in academia against conservatives. Uh, Christopher, let me ask you the question that uh, Dr. Wesley threw out to us. Where are the conservatives on campus? Where are are they what's your assessment are they being denied work Are they not applying what's the deal yeah i mean i hate to give a boring response but it's probably a mixture of two things i, mean, I don't think um uh, it's it's wrong to suggest there are different personality types that have different interests right i think that's pretty clear jonathan heights a social psychologist done some really good stuff on this and he tried they, you know he's done some research where you take the big five personality traits like the things that are actually predictive of of, of, of real differences and he does find that there are different 
uh, uh, personality traits that you find in general, not exclusively over different political persuasions. And it's quite possible that people self-select out for those personality type reasons. I think that's probably likely. But it's also quite likely that you know, when you, uh, as, uh, you know, as the professor said, when, when you don't see yourself in an institution, that you might self-select out of that yourself as well, because you just don't see those viewpoints being, being represented. Um, I mean, that might be behind uh, 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 these students forming, you know, organizations for in defense of, of, of Western, you know, Western, Western civilizations, right? Which you might think, why is someone doing that? But in, in, in the midst of a kind of embrace about identity politics more generally, uh, if someone feels that their their identity, if they identify with that, is going to be being demeaned, that's it's kind of it's sort of a natural human response to kind of come and defend that. And the, and the dilemma is if people are going to universities where they're being given a kind of politically skewed uh, explanations for certain kind of cultural histories, which is the case, then they're likely to be attracted to these kinds of organizations. If and if we had a more diverse uh, uh, faculty, if they had a diverse, you know, media as well, then they might see those see those ideas represented. I should say, you know, we we I published the op-ed with, with my colleague. We tried to get this published in the Globe. They didn't want to talk about it. We tried to get it published in the Toronto Star. They didn't want to talk about it. We thought about going to CBC opinion, but then we, we, we looked to see you know, if, if they'd ever published the last you know, 50 op-eds, a single conservative voice, and we couldn't find one. So there's, it's not just universities. And if you don't find certain, if, if, if people aren't interested in hearing this news, you know, luckily the National Post w w would print it, but that's not surprising that the National Post would print it. Um, and it, what you need are institutions like the university that are supposed to be truth seeking, that aren't supposed to be partisan. They're supposed to be about what is the truth. Uh, and you just need diverse voices in those institutions and all kinds of diverse voices. Dr. Wesley, I have a question, but I also just want to allow you to respond to that. I want to invite you to respond to that, I should say. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a whole other show to talk about whether, you know, teaching uh, for I teach Canadian politics and political behavior, whether I'm teaching it through a culturally biased lens, I suppose, is a whole other show. Um, but it, it does raise an interesting methodological point. Um, we've been talking all about how faculty and professors might be biased, but we're not talking a lot about um, what's about student experience, right? I, I've yet to see a study about Canadian um, social science and humanities students and, and whether they feel alienated or not in, in their classrooms. And this brings me back to my original point, just because you're on the left side of the political spectrum doesn't mean that you harbor some kind of anti-conservative bias. And I also noticed in, in professors' comments, and it's easy to do, I do it all the time, but we're conflating ideological position with partisanship. Um, I don't think it would surprise anyone to find that there are a lack of conservative partisans on campuses across Alberta right now. Uh, and that has a lot to do with this government's approach to post-secondary education. Again, Ryan, another, another show. But I think it's important to note that a lot of people who, who have harbor um, real animosity uh, towards this conservative government wouldn't uh, then pass that on to their students or indoctrinate them in, in, in any way in, in, in that sense. I get back to my original question, where, where are the conservatives? Um, I think, you know, here's a hypothesis to test if we were to do a national student survey. I don't think that we have a, a lower proportion of young conservatives in universities than we have in the general population. Um, I think that the numbers would probably be generally about the same. I think where, where we find uh, most conservative youth is not in universities at all. And that, that's a problem that I think we, we need to start talking about. I told you that I come from a small town, about 2,500 people in, in, in Southwest Manitoba. Um, the, my riding holds the, uh, my home riding holds the designation as being the only uh, one that has returned a conservative MP since it entered Confederation. Okay, this is as conservative a riding as they come. <laughs> um, and uh, when I first stepped step foot on campus, again, my first reaction was not, uh, are, are my, are my uh, teachers or my, my instructors more progressive or not? It, it, it was, do they look like me? Do they talk like me? Do they think like me? So one of the beautiful things that the University of Alberta has done over time, I think, through campuses like we have it, at Augustana is to actually try to build, build relationships with rural communities where we know from research uh, we're likely to find more conservative folks. And if you go to Augustana campus, we did some focus groups up there with students. Um, you, do, you do find, I think, some more conservative uh, values in, in campuses like that. And I would, love, I would love to see more of those students, you know, coming into the, in, into the main campus and, and being part of our classrooms because they do enrich those discussions. But 
it's one thing to say that and then have a government that is clawing back, <laughs> you know, resources to support that kind of that kind of community building. Um, and the uh, other reasons why I don't think some of these folks from rural areas are coming to universities, it's it's massively expensive and getting more expensive by the year. Again, part of a conservative policy. Um, and and there, I think there's also a sense among people when we go out and do focus groups and ask them, how do you feel about academics? How do you feel about universities? They see us as being a bunch of, of distanced elites called ivory tower academics and so on. Um, so that's the kind of culture that conservatives, uh, conservative youth are growing up in and may make them more likely to um, self-select away from an undergraduate education, let alone getting to the point where they're, they're choosing whether they want to go on to do a master's or a PhD. I'm Christopher, I'm going to give you a chance to answer this, but I want to put it in front of Stephen first. Stephen's uh, obviously ta uh, talked to hundreds of students through the course of, uh, of his journalistic uh, career. Uh, this is a comment from uh, Kevin Kent, an entrepreneur based out of Calgary uh, on my Twitter relating to this conversation. Kevin says modern conservatism, in my mind, this is his opinion, is mean spirited, negative, always talking about fighting, anti-human being and anti-science or anti-intelligence. I can't support it. Uh, it's responded to by an individual. I don't know who this is. Their their Twitter handle wrong on any level says I probably identified as conservative ish for 20 or 25 years. But in the last 10 years or so, I become more and more liberal. I think it's interesting, though, that conservatives have staked out this negative tone and aggressive stance. Stephen, is that a fair assessment? I mean, do you believe that can, can you characterize conservatism as anti intellectual? It's a hell of a thing to say, isn't it? I mean, is it accurate in your mind? We might have lost your audio, Stephen. Um, are we uh, we good? I uh, there we go. Muted myself. Um, I I think you know, it's there's a debate around around what exactly conservative conservatism is, mm -hmm. and there are definitely conservative intellectuals out there. Like that's, I mean, I could name any number of them. But I think what students look at, and when we say campus, when we say campus issues, when the average Canadian or the average American looks looks at campus. And they're like, well, what do you, you know, you may not spend much time there, but what do you think is going on on um, Canadian campuses or American campuses? They're likely to see the kind of melees that kind of happen between uh, when when a, a group of students try to protest a speaker or something like that. And I think, you know, in in those cases, students are turned off. And I think, you know, a broad swath of students you know, not just the uh, the more activist um, groups uh, look at conservatism and they say, well, this is this is you know a an ideology or a perspective that um, uh, inherently uh, tries to uh, preserve hierarchies and it tries to brush issues that we care about under the under the rug. You know, we want to talk about um, socioeconomic inequality, but. Uh, we want to talk about racial inequality, but we have this guy on campus like Charles Murray who says that, you know, who attributes inequality and and um, uh, the black poor to uh, you know some kind of genetic basis, and they simply find this unacceptable. So, I think you know, it, I'm hard pressed to find, and particularly when speaking to students, I think they're hard pressed to find a conservatism that they find they can even liaise with because they don't find they they don't have a perception of of conservatives or of conservatism as having any kind of compassion whatsoever um and again when we uh, this is you know again it's it might be a little bit more separate from the, uh, the faculty issues and the department issues and who gets published and who doesn't get published and who gets read or who doesn't get read um but I do, I do, I do feel like that's an increasing, you know, that that kind of anti-conservative um, pers perspective um, has heightened because uh, whatever lack of compassion, whatever lack of concern for justice, has been heightened by this new new populist wave that I certainly see going across some, you know, a number of campuses. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dummett, I, I want to ask you about this because 
I, I mean, is the assessment fair? I mean, this what I'm about to put in front of you is is certainly anecdotal. Uh, but prior to hosting this show, I, I hosted a talk show on on arguably the most conservative radio station in Canada. Uh, and I know what I would see on our text line when I when I would talk, you know, from conservatives. And let me say, I know many brilliant conservatives. However, when I would talk about things like gender studies or climate science, uh, the blowback, the pushback that I would see from conservatives was unignorable. It was remarkable. And when I look at some of the attacks on universities, and I, and I, and I use that word intentionally, attacks on universities, um, either through, in my mind, sl- slanderous speech, uh, through uh, attempts to discredit universities. I'm talking straight from the Alberta's premier's office, um, from, from, from attacks on funding or, 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 or attacks on research and the stability there. Um, I can only assume that the assertion that there is a bias against conservatives on campus is an attempt to justify defunding or discrediting those very institutions is this unfair in your perspective what i make you know the the observations that i'm making or what steven just said or dr wesley before him well i don't know if it's unfair i guess i would say that uh the last thing i want is to defund universities and that's not why I'm mentioning it. I, I'm not, I can't say that someone couldn't use this information I provide and say that we, we ought to defund universities. They're, they're not worth having. In fact, that's kind of why we're writing this. That's kind of why I'm, I'm concerned about this, because I think it would be a logical partisan interpretation to see if, if an institution has been captured by a political viewpoint, which is different from yours, uh, uh, that it would make sense to shut it down in, in a purely partisan way. But that would be a, a huge loss, to, a social loss, if that's the case. And that's kind of why I'm saying we need to we need to make sure that we're providing intellectual, ideological diversity of viewpoints so that you know uh, people across the political spectrum can can find uh, thoughtful, uh, interested, intelligent voices that are carrying on a re- real public discussions about about things like the environment, about things like uh, uh, various various kinds of public policy issues, about poverty, about how you deal with uh, income inequality, all these things. And if if there's such a skew in universities that this this is going to fuel those kinds of anti intellectual voices, which I think are are there absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think drifting, the state- yeah, but I mean, we're, we're we're drifting back and forth between the identity and the 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 you know the, the proclivities of the, of the individual professors uh, and the way that they teach. I'm looking back to my I just I told you I did my undergrad here at the University of Alberta. It was a combined history and and political science degree, and I, so I say professor off the top. I said there are differences in, in disciplines because my history experience was very different from my political science experience. But the one assignment that I remember that I that still comes back to me. Um, was in an American history course where I was asked to delve into the political philosophy of George Fitzhugh. Uh, Now, as I said, my 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 father's black. My mother is is white. Um, Slavery is is just below the surface of a lot of uh, conversations about race in my family and my community. And George Fitzhugh gave an economic argument in favor of slavery. Okay, I remember that assignment. It was assigned to me. I don't think he, he my professor looked at me and said, oh, you're a dark sort of fellow. I think I'm going to assign you this, right? But but rather it was uh, it, it it was a challenge to to get underneath those ideas and to reflect them back and, and and interpret them in a way that the author intended, and then to critically analyze them from the other point of view. I had exactly the same experience at the University of Calgary when on our comprehensive exam list for our PhD, we were assigned Tom Flanagan's First Nations Second Thoughts, an an, an amazingly frustrating book to read if you do not agree with that viewpoint. But I still continue to assign it to my students, some of whom you know, have reported me to, to other professors and saying, he's making me read this racist you know, piece, of, piece of garbage. It, 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 it provided that these pieces are, are intellectually stimulating enough to have been published by reputable presses, this is the stuff that we should be assigning in our classrooms. I don't think many people would call me a movement conservative. But the fact that I that I assign those types of books in, in, in my class shouldn't earn me that that label. Right. And I think we need to start separating people's own individual, you know, proclivities from the way that they teach students in their classrooms, because I got to tell you, we could solve a lot of this if, if many journalists and many critics of academia would actually come job shadow us for two weeks. You'd find a lot less brandy sipping than you, than you think. 
And, and, and I think you'd find a lot, a lot less, a lot, a lot more boredom <laughs> in my day-to-day -day job rather than sitting around thinking about how can I direct a syllabus so that I'm indoctrinating students. That's what gets me upset about this stuff. And it also so, gets me upset because the stereotype that we are that way paints over a lot of the inequalities and a lot of the hard work that we still need to do to make folks that are, have been traditionally marginalized in academia feel like they're at home. Maybe we have to do something to make conservatives feel more at home, but I got to tell you, we got a long way to go to make folks on all parts of the spectrum feel like they have a home and see people like them in positions like mine. Christopher, so, I mean, I, I just want to say, like, I, I feel like I feel like I'm making a friend. I feel like on so many things, we actually agree. Like, I fundamentally agree that it sounds like your approach to education is the right one. That you teach people from genuinely different viewpoints, and that's exactly and that's what history is supposed to do. It's not supposed to, uh, uh, you know, censor material because we would now consider it offensive. It's supposed to go back in the past and really get a sense of why did they think this? You know, where were they coming from? Uh, uh, my experience is that that is increasingly uh, that viewpoint that you're expressing is un, is under attack and it's under threat from a variety of ways. And the one of the key key ways it is is the rise of a, a this kind of languages around harm uh, and this idea that you want to protect people from potentially harmful speech. And harm is interpreted in some really kind of broad ways. And there's some good social psychology around the, the idea of concept creep and how the harm since about the 1980s has, has incredibly expanded to include inc increasingly less, uh, less dramatic, less violent act activities. And it's exactly these arguments about harm that are increasingly being used to say, oh, we can't teach someone like Tom, Tom Flanagan because that's harmful to have. And I, I see these arguments coming in all the time. Uh, in, in all kinds of situations. And so I, I actually think I you and I would probably agree and we probably share a kind of pedagogy and I think it would be a danger to, you know, we probably share a, a commitment to academic freedom and academic different, different viewpoints. My worry is that especially these languages around harm are increasingly putting that under threat. I want to read this from uh, Brent Whitmire, who's watching this morning. Uh, this is an interesting response. He responded to you, as a matter of fact, Dr. Wesley, when you tweeted about this. He said, you know, different faculties and disciplines have uh, distinct sociological features, which lead to different uh, political or cultural outlooks. Much like allegations of media bias, it's a misleadingly simplistic narrative that serves political ends. Also should add, he says that the donor base of most institutions tends to skew more conservative for obvious reasons. And with the transformation of university administration to more of a business leadership model, there's been a sociological shift as well, which is is an interesting point to make. Uh, we, we've hit our time, so to speak, but I certainly want to leave a, a couple of minutes for each of you to, to I suppose, put a, a closing statement in, in, in front of us. I, I always want to give us something to walk with, something to chew on today, especially for those of us that admittedly, like myself, have not been on a university campus, at least in a meaningful context, for many years. Uh, Stephen, what's something that we should, as as you know, either university students watching this or or as people into into their later adult years, what's something we should be thinking about when this conversation, if this conversation comes up in our own personal lives? What's one thing to be thinking about? You're on mute again, my man. Excuse me. All good. Um, I think you know this is part of a broader cultural conversation or part of a broader cultural issue. Um, I think there are voices on, you know, like like uh, Professor Wesley was saying, there are students of color um, or, you know, future scholars of color who take a look at what's around them and they feel that um, the there's not enough representation. OK, but there's also where this is also happening in the broader context where there is a kind of new kind of conservatism that uh, is sweeping across. Um, maybe, you know, outside of the classroom, but is sweeping across campuses, um, legitimized by different political voices in the United States, it was Donald Trump, and in Canada, it was, uh, it was different, different voices. And I think that that's creating uh, a space where it, it is becoming harder to have a conversation. But I think, you know, we have to, we have to be more vigilant about, okay, if we're going to, going to present the uh, conservative perspective, do we have people in our camp or groups or voices in our camp that are trying to hijack that conversation, making it less about intellectual exchange, but more about kind of bullying, uh, bullying others in a way that 
in a way that inserts a perspective that is, you know, argues for a so-called white ethno state or whatever. And I think you could say that about the left as well. But I think we are living in a time where this new right wing populism um, is making it hard, harder to do that for both sides. Uh, Christopher, your, your closing statement, so to speak. I, I'm not. I'm not sure quite what I have. I guess I would say uh, I would read the last point that I think we need to be care- we need to be vigilant for a kind of you know small l liberal values that we respect viewpoint diversity and that's pretty integral to it. Uh, if we want knowledge to be uh, uh, useful, if we want knowledge to be respected, and if we want to avoid political polarization. We need institutions like like a good media, uh, ideally, which I, I think is not really in existence anymore, unfortunately, or and good universities, which are which are which people can point to and say, yes, I, I, I trust the the advice here, I trust the knowledge here because I know it's been rigorously tested. And as it is, I'm afraid to say that there are there is a danger. I'm not saying it's absent, but there's a great danger if there's such a political skew that 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 knowledge claims just aren't being tested, and this is only going to fuel kind of anti-intellectualism. Dr. Wesley, we'll give you last word. I think my, my, my worry is, is for the broader community, not just in this particular debate. Um, Michael Ignatieff once wrote about the perils of, of transitioning uh, our language from talking about our, our opponents as adversaries, as people that we want to defeat through debate in our classrooms and elsewhere, to talking about them as enemies, people that need to be vanquished, othering them in, in such a way that it becomes an us versus them kind of thing. And too often when this conversation comes up, that's what it turns into. Right. And, and so I challenge my students in my classrooms, I challenge people in my Twitter feed to get away from saying, uh, you know, uh, those academics have a, have a bias against conservatives, big C conservatives, and start talking about what's actually happening in our classrooms, what's actually happening in our journals. Um, and, and to be honest, if we start having that conversation, we'll find that as heated as this, these types of debates can, can become, particularly on social media or, or when politicians are on the hustings, they're, they we're actually in pretty good shape in a lot of our in a lot of our institutions across this country. I've taught in, in three very different ones with three very different reputations and different faculty sets. And all of my colleagues I've found are, are very open to the notion of debating debating ideas uh, and, and not labeling people or labeling as students as, as being in one camp or another. I'm so grateful uh, for the opportunity to bring you three together and and in some cases disagree and in some cases find common ground and most importantly, get all of us to think. And I want to thank you for giving us this hour of your time. Uh, Dr. Christopher Dummett out of Trent University, uh, Dr. Jared Wesley out of the University of Alberta and investigative journalist Stephen Zhao. To the three of you, uh, my gratitude. We'll talk to you again soon. You bet. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, To the real talkers. Um. I hope you took something from this. Uh, you know, Greg says, of course, Dr. Dummett doesn't like the media. <laughs> it, it, it was inevitable that that was going to come in. I mean, there was, so, there was so much ground that we didn't get to here, right? I saw another uh, a comment on Twitter that I thought was really good from Omar Masood and, and, I, uh, Masood rather, and I appreciate Omar watching. He says, I mean, are we asking if there's a small, small C anti-conservative bias or like a partisan anti-conservative bias? In other words, a bias against the Conservative Party of Canada. Uh, Jason on Twitter, Jason Bazell says, you know, it feels less anti-conservative, um, you know, and more conservatives defending defunding education. So how could the organization be pro-conservative if the platform is to cut? He says it feels to me like oil and gas companies would have the same anti-progressive feel inside their orgs, their organizations. Emmett McFarlane, uh, I appreciate Emmett chiming in. I mean, he's a professor of political science. He's, he's been on this show before. Uh, you know, he was he was talking about uh, what was it about the governor general? Yep. He was talking about the process of whether or not Canada could could simply dump the governor general. And it was a, it was a thoughtful response. And he said he said, yes, there is a bias against conservatives, um, he says. But but in, in perhaps more of a, a subtle or complex way than many conservatives might think. And so I, I, I was pretty proud of myself. Sam, can we put this on the screen? Because I was, I was pretty proud of I, I thought that my gif game. I know some say GIF, GIF, I don't know. It's like pergola, pergola, who knows? Sounds like these need to be in our next big questions poll. Yes. How did we miss the boat on asking if it's GIF or JIF? <laughs> I just know yeah, that we'll do another one. I just know that there's an Edmonton based company that's doing amazing work. And uh, and quite frankly, I think they're making a ton of dough on it. And the company is called Jiffy Cat. 
So yes. it, it is it does that inherently make it a GIF? Regardless, doesn't matter. So so the good professor Emmett McFarlane, can we put this up on the screen? Because I was pretty proud of my of my GIF game. Um, he, he says in far more subtle or complex ways than many conservatives think. And I and I said, go on. And there you have it. Mark. It's good use of the Mark Cuban. Gift. Thank you very much. Mark Cuban taking notes. I think that's from the show Shark Tank, if I recognize it correctly. I said, go on. And he said, OK, well, a typical, you know, conservative or media portrayal of modern universities is that they're populated by a bunch of liberal Marxist faculty bent on brainwashing students to leftist ideology. Let me let me like that live while we're talking. He says that's just not the case. He says most professors we get we take you behind the curtain here, man. You get to watch the Wizard of Oz at work. He says that's just not the case. Most professors don't care to try. And those that do ignore the most important reality that students can't be brainwashed to conform to some ideological standard. There are, however, issues. One is that faculty, especially in the humanities and social sciences, leans heavily to the left. He says this is both symbolically and substantively a problem in my view, says Dr. McFarland. There are definitely perspectives not heard or not heard enough on some topics. I'll like that one, too. He says even this varies widely by discipline or even by subfield. But it means in some areas, I think there's a tendency to relatively dogmatic or narrow perspectives in academia. I also think there's some fraction of faculty who are illiberal or just plain rigid in their views on certain topics. I like that trend that we talked about today about, about sort of a fixed ideology. He says, often broadly, those concerning identity politics, certain social issues, and that can risk manifesting as anti-conservative bias, uh, says Professor McFarland. But I think that context is also far less common or prevalent than is often portrayed in discussions about academia and ideology. And he'll earn a like from me on that as well. Sam, you're a cerebral guy. What did you take? What did you, uh, you know, I, uh, so I say, things, I use, yeah. I invoke the word cerebral so I can come across as cerebral, but what did you take out of that conversation? Oh boy. What did I take out of that conversation? I mean, um, from your 11 pages of notes. Yeah, exactly. I actually, you know, I interestingly enough, I was engaging a lot with what Stephen Zhao was saying. Um, and that's only just because I, you know, I've, I've had experiences working with students on various campuses across the Canada, uh, across Canada. Uh, at one point in time I ran Canadian university press. I was on student campuses all over the country. Uh, I met with a lot of people. And we so, get it, Sam. You're kind of a big deal. No, but I'm just, <laughs> Whoa. Uh, I turn my compressor up there. Um, but, um, no, but you know, the whole idea uh, to me is that I, I think that there's something to say this, um, a thing that, that, that kind of came up to me too, and, and this didn't come up in the, so the conversation, and I might be tossing a grenade here, is I, I do think age is a little bit of a factor. Um, I've met a lot of 20 somethings that are just starting to form their political pins and they're starting to form their political beliefs. And I think that especially when you're in that scenario, um, you tend to want to pick a side. You want to go as hard to one way or the other as you can, because as a young person trying to make your mark on the world, you have to be, you have to have conviction in your issues and you have to be able to stand up and defend your beliefs. And, and it's interesting because I think it comes across as performative sometimes. I think that there's definitely sometimes, you know, when, when uh, Stephen Zhao talked about how we're in a place right now that anytime there's a speaker that people don't agree with, the, the trigger is now to, um, create a counter protest right away and and well just look at my look at my twitter post that yeah. we were going to have these three guys on yeah exactly like and just look at what happened to my twitter protest it, it was unbelievable yeah and i think that you know um i think it's spot on what dr wesley said that we need to engage in issues not ideologies and that you know if if you talk to somebody, you sort of break down these beliefs. You can, well, I mean, number one, you can find some common ground, but certainly number two, you can see what drives them. I can say in my own life, a thing that I've just observed in and of myself is, is, you know, I don't think I've become more conservative as I got older, but I certainly have more appetite to have thoughtful discussions with conservative viewpoints that I probably don't agree with, but really want to actually put the facts on the table and see if they hold merit and and have like a real discussion so this predisposition to sort of other people and shut people off and be a little bit performative in our viewpoints i think is is a you know a really big takeaway from me uh one thing i want to invoke and and for context i should actually say that <laughs> this was spoken to me by uh a friend who is 
you know, a, a young female indigenous journalist. And she said, it's not the woke Olympics in that, you know, we shouldn't be just trying to show people as firmly on our sleeves what our viewpoints are and how we align with a certain perspective because that's not actually engaging in issues. I really like this, and, and that's bang on, and I, and I really like this comment from Scott uh, on our live chat. Uh, if you're listening to this later on the podcast, I encourage you from time to time to watch our shows on YouTube, and um, you know, you're going to find that there's an amazing conversation that occurs as we're talking, as these interviews are going, and, and Real Talkers, even if, if you're not hearing your comments read all the time, it doesn't mean we're not noticing them. It doesn't mean that you're not uh, fueling our editorial engine. We really appreciate it. Scott says, you know, the question is not, our universities anti-conservative the question needs to be does society really want universities to serve as a place to debate the merits of ideas from the wildest spectrum of possibilities or not surely there are not only conservative ideals and then and then any idea that isn't conservative the question implies a, a very harmful good versus bad binary way of thinking that fosters militant escalation and oppositional flag waving that entrenches the, the American style of bipartisan dogma, Scott says. And there's got to be a better question as surely there's got to be a better system of government. No, that from Scott. Interesting comment. I really like it. And then there's a whole debate going on right now, whether it's GIF or JIF. Like some random guy says, the inventor of the GIF says it's supposed to be a J, J, J sound. I, I have heard this as well, and, he, it, and it hurt me. He, he <laughs> says, he says but, but, but some random guy says, I say it with a hard key, so GIF. Um, and, and, then, and then people are, are debating this. I mean, I love this from Kim, who says it's, it's graphic user interface. G is like g g graphic. She says, I don't care what the inventor says. He's wrong. That from Kim, which is amazing. We're going to get to more of your comments in just a second. Right now, I want to remind you that if your family or if you yourself are looking to upgrade your ride right now, why not take a look at the 2021 Jeep lineup? From the fuel-efficient compass, no word of a lie, a guy stopped me on the street yesterday to talk about the 2021 Jeep lineup. Adver oh. Advertising on Real Talk works. Oh, I love this. Yeah, he said, he said you're, what's you're out. You're out shilling Jeeps. You get commission on this, right? <laughs> well, I mean, we don't advertise, they don't advertise for free, Sam, if that's what you're asking. Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. I am driving the Grand Cherokee, which I love, but this guy was actually asking me about the compass. He was like, what's your, what's your take on the compass? I was like, I'm not that familiar with it. It's kind of the grocery getter. It's like the, the fuel-efficient, uh, you know, the fuel efficient option in the jeep lineup i mean they're going to want me to say they're all fuel efficient but the compass is the one that if you want to fill it up like once every six weeks that's the one you go with they've also got the gladiator and the big rubicon wranglers and, and the grand cherokee l that's coming out the third seat the seven seater you're not going to find a better selection in the province than you will at st albert and sherwood dodge go say hi to scott and alan and their teams there the team at local waste i know that they're very excited for trash talk tomorrow they tell us every single week that they get super excited about it i saw one of their trucks on my way to work today did you yes, I did. did you give him a little like, nit, nit, like I, not I, I didn't but i wanted to just like reach out my sunroof and just yell trash talk at trash it. talk <laughs> that's right local waste for more than a quarter century more than 25 years has been in the game helping small and large business owners find a better more local solution to their waste management garbage and recycling and they love to talk trash with you you can find them online at localwaste.ca you will also find the team at Alta Moving and Storage under the Sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. It's heading into spring. More and more people are going to be thinking about moving, but a lot of you aren't going to move. And you know why? You know why. I know why. It's because it's stressful, because it sucks. Moving sucks. But you can take the suck out of it, like as Terry and Diener used to say, turn down the suck by calling Alta Moving and Storage. First person on the live chat to cite the movie is going to win a prize. Turn down the <laughs> suck with Alta Moving and Storage. They've got these pod-style containers. They drop them off at your house. It means you move on your pace, not while the big 18-wheelers sitting outside your house idling and all the neighbors are annoyed that the street's tied up. You got sweat pouring down your brow and you're not ready to go. You haven't even said goodbye to your place, let alone moved out of it. The team at Alta Moving and Storage wants to take out the suck. That might be their new... No, it's probably not going to be their new logo. Probably not going to be their new logo. Uh, you could. I suspect it will not be yeah. their new logo. Talk at RyanJesperson.com, or a slogan, I should say, not logo. Yeah. Talk at RyanJesperson.com is where you can send us emails, and I love this from Susan. Susan's email just 34 minutes ago arrived hot in our inbox. She says, I wanted to comment about your panel about university bias since I taught in the business faculty for more than 20 years. 
uh, at the University of Calgary. Susan says my entire department was conservative. She says, I pioneered the corporate social responsibility course at the institution. It was only approved because it was considered to be a trendy topic, even though it was dear to my heart. I was ostracized for my leftist views when I would espouse the thinking that, you know, the one who dies with the most toys wins philosophy is a warped view of the world or that success is not only defined as having a lot of money. Susan says, I, I refused, as a matter of fact, to let my daughter attend the University of Calgary for poli sci because it's so conservative. It's reflected in their teaching, their topics, and the way that they assess student work. It was so biased. It was incredible. That from Susan, who taught for 20 years and then says she refused to let her daughter attend the University of Calgary. I mean, the University of Calgary's political science faculty, I mean, we we name dropped and talked about Tom Flanagan and Stephen Harper and Ezra Levant and all of the, I mean, they have graduated essentially. Basically the Canadian conservative establishment. The Canadian conservative establishment. Yeah. The the Petri dish is the University of Calgary. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be an offensive term? Is somebody going to take it? it, Somebody's (laughs) going to read into it. Jesperson calling Canadian conservatives bacteria, you know, grown in a Petri dish. Mark says, uh, Jesper, I just finished listening uh, to to the show and and I've really enjoyed it. Says, as a matter of fact, I've enjoyed all of them. Thanks, pal. He says, I've never really been interested in radio talk shows. Because they seem so directed and so washed. He says, I've never felt like we heard the whole story. Uh, I've always felt like we only hear one side of any given situation. You're not afraid, Ryan, to bring on controversial people, to challenge our preconceived notions, and to bring important issues to our attention. You ask questions we all want to know. And if you don't think of one, your online listeners do. He's bang on there. He says, Real Talk is a powerful program. You and Sam are creating something that I look forward to listening to for many years to come. I hope you're signed up for years, Sam. Mark says, Yeah, I got nothing else to do. (laughs) Mark says, Sam's going to go straight. As soon as we go off air, he's going to go straight into uh, contract extension talk. uh, Mark says, There are so many things that we need to fix in this province, and I had given up hope that it was possible. And now I actually feel like we can fix these things. Oof, Mark, you're going to make me cry. He says that there are some amazing people with answers and with directions and with insight on the way forward. And then then I love this, a little shout out to Ayla Brooke. He says, thank you for lifting us up every day. That from Mark. Dude, thank you. You have no idea what an email like that does to us. That's absolutely incredible. That email lifted me up. I remember reading it. It was great. You know what? People, people... Uh, don't know. I mean, like sometimes I'll, I'll get an email. Uh, you, I should say we will get an email. If you send it to talk at ryanjesperson.com, you get Sam and I, and soon it'll also be directed to our new Chase producer um, who will be, uh, we believe, uh, I don't want to jinx anything, but introducing you to them in, in the next few weeks. Um, sometimes there are emails that we don't read on the show because they're just like one-liners that are like, great show, guys, or keep it up, or, or, you know, or keep your chin up, or don't listen to the haters, or keep your eyes on the prize. These types of emails fill our tank each and every day. There's also emails where, where people will think about a conversation that we've had and, and, and maybe we'll get it like in some cases days or even weeks after the interview. And I appreciate this. We, we just got this from Mr. Dad. Uh, you, you may not believe this, but that's not his real name. Uh, but he says, please refer to me as Mr. Dad, as I'm sure, as I'm certain I will be crucified by some people for the perspective I'm about to share. He says, I took exception to some of the messaging from your guests on International Women's Day on Monday, particularly around this theme of child care and family obligations being such an offensive concept. Mr. Dad says, I've spent the last year and a half in caregiver capacity for my 16-month-old daughter and my wife after my wife suffered a crippling mental health event at six weeks postpartum, uh, leaving her completely incapacitated for the past year. I was forced to take a leave of absence from a well-established, lucrative career to care for my family, and we were very much left to fend for ourselves during this crisis, except for the support of a few devoted family members. COVID rendered the already limited social supports, usually available, to non-existent. And when I returned to work this January, I was immediately laid off by my employer without notice because they were unwilling to accommodate my request for limited out-of-town travel until my wife's able to safely and confidently handle things independently. We never know what our fellow audience members are walking with and living with and, 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 and facing every single day, do we? 
Mr. Dad says it's so frustrating to hear all the recent societal and political rhetoric and pressure to immediately ship our babies off to daycare as if no other alternative exists. What's wrong with the stay-at-home parent, especially during the preschool years? Why not offer the option and support to facilitate this for families who prefer such an arrangement instead of funneling all funding into institutionalized child care provided by strangers? I suspect the societal cost per family would be comparable or maybe even cheaper. This would have especially made sense during COVID when we were supposed to be minimizing contacts. Contacts, But instead, the government bent over backwards to do the exact opposite. Mr. Dad says, as I write this, you know, I'm constantly being interrupted by my daughter as she brings me books and delivers snuggles. Although the circumstances of I just got chills. He says that although the circumstances of the last 16 months have been challenging, I cherish the extra time I've spent with my little girl and family. And I'm certain that these are some of the days I will wish to relive the most when I'm old. Oh, my gosh. He says, not once have I considered this time a burden of care. That from Mr. Dad. That's beautiful. Uh, now, I know that we're going to hear from advocates for, for fully funded child care, for uh, $25 a day daycare, for what he described as institutional uh, government funded structure. And they will also make compelling arguments about this type of thing. And that's why this show is important. Because no matter what your perspective and, and no matter whether or not you're, you're going to write in as, as Robert or Brenda or, or Mr. Dad, uh, your opinion matters to us. And we are here to have conversations that are in some cases uncomfortable, uh, in some cases to you unpalatable. And the good news is, is that you're never going to be forced to participate in those conversations. But we want you to know that if there's something that you just can't stop thinking about. I mean, you know, for example, for Mr. Dad there, it might be the idea that perhaps there should be some sort of a tax credit for families that choose to keep one parent in the home as opposed to have two parents working. For other families, you know, for other family units, that may not work. You may say, well, yeah, I'm a single dad or I'm a single mom. I'm working three jobs right now. It's not an option. Must be nice, Mr. Dad, to be able to stay home. Don't talk to me about burden of care. You know, my burden is trying to put, you know, food on the table, trying to trying to make sure that I can get my kid into a daycare where where I know that I can feel comfortable, that they feel safe and they're getting the supports they need while I bust my ass with a high school diploma making minimum wage trying to make ends meet. Both of these perspectives are valuable. And we're going to continue to have these types of conversations. We promise you that. And we always want to hear from you to talk at RyanJesperson.com or of course you can hit us up using our hashtag RealTalkRJ on Twitter. We pay close attention to that. A quick reminder that if you're able to, to get out, even if it's just to hit a drive through you know, you can, you can have a date night. You can treat yourself for five bucks, five bucks at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Make sure at the drive through window or even in the note on your uh, delivery app if you're getting, although I don't know if you want to be getting ice cream delivered on the delivery app. I've had a blizzard delivered, and it's great. Although blizzards, when they get a little soft, like when they get a little melty to yeah. me, that's when they're their best. That's true. They're, I mean, they're they're pretty rock hard when first. I mean, they do the they do the flip test. They do right? the they flip show test. How thick they are, and I it's love just like, that. And they're great, and they're thick. But I mean, you're right. They're uh, they're 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 a little much a, to what eat. What about when a dipped fresh. cone? I mean, because you're a big fan of the dipped cone. Does the does the chocolate dip protect the cone? From, so, do you buy yourself some time with the dip? I, I don't think I've ever had a dipped cone delivered. I have observed many times being a child watching my dad eat a dipped cone while driving, and my conclusion is it's safe until you bite the chocolate. Once Fair. that seal is broken, you're on a ticking clock. It's like going pee when you're drinking. Yes. <laughs> Once you break the seal, the team at Dairy Queen right now is like, seriously? urination talk in the middle of our ad read <laughs> you're not going to get that on your average terrestrial radio station i promise you that they'll promise you that too but this is real talk break the seal at your own peril and go get a two for five dollar treat night if it wasn't the team at dairy queen i'd never get away with this but they're amazing after 8 p.m every single night five bucks gets you the opportunity to mix and match any two medium dip cones and sundays at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. I'm going to reflect on that ad read. and Maybe that'll be the last time we invoke urination when talking about ice cream. I don't know. I won't make you the promise because we're live and we don't read scripts, Sam, do we? No. Tomorrow, it's our solar panel. 
which we're super excited about. If you have thoughts on renewables, uh, and I know some of you are going to say, well, why aren't you talking about geothermal? Why aren't you talking about nuclear? Why aren't you talking about wind? We will, my friends. We will. But tomorrow we're talking solar. If you have a question for our three panelists, waka waka, talk our, at right shining Jesperson. lights that we're going to get. <laughs> oh, jeez. Our rays Sam, of sunshine. Sam, stop. Keep it going, pal. <laughs> That's tomorrow at 9 a.m. Mountain, 11 Eastern. The show starts at 8.30, my friends. It's going to be electrifying. Jeez. We'll talk to you then. They're going to let you up.